Good morning and welcome. Welcome to what I have every confidence is going to prove to be one of the most uh, enjoyable, most intellectually stimulating Sunday mornings you have had in a very long time. <laughs> Uh, so I say this with total confidence because you will be in the care of Emily. So Emily Holmes, uh, a brief introduction. So she started out uh, in Oxford. She has reverberated between Oxford and Cambridge at different points in her career. Um, pausing most briefly, I guess, to go to London long enough to get one of two doctorates. So she has a clinical doctorate and she went back to Cambridge where she got a PhD. She got a, a rather prestigious fellowship in Oxford that led on to a chair there. But these days she is in Stockholm at the Karolinska. So please, uh, hands together to welcome Emily. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction, and I definitely agree with you about the um, early morning Sunday thing. So, thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, it's been really interesting to start a conversation with many of you. And for me, that seems to be the most marvellous thing about coming to a meeting or a conference, that it's a start of a discussion. So I feel very humbled sitting here having to give a bit of a summary of our work. What I really hope it is, um, is something that leads to further thinking. Um, and you very kindly already explained my background. Um, what I didn't mention in that is actually I went to art college as well, down the corner in Falmouth. <laughs> but I usually keep that off my uh, neuroscience CV. Um, but I guess what I'm really interested in is what we might mean when we talk about mental imagery um, as a process. And for me as a clinician, I'm particularly interested in emotional aspects. So I'll be talking about one very small piece of a fascinating puzzle. Um, and um, this is just a brilliant word. Like, I don't actually quite know how to pronounce it. Is it phenomenalism or phenomenalism? But it's like, that's, I suppose, what... To me, being a scientist who's interested in how the science of mental life, that's the old term for psychology, like how our minds work, it kind of feels like that from a whole different series of reasons. Firstly, and luckily, there aren't very many people who do tightrope walking, probably. It always scares me when I see people do tightrope walking, but there aren't an enormous number of people in the imagery field, which is kind of incredible, given what an ordinary part it is or isn't of all of our lives. Um, it also gives us, if one's high in imagery, uh, an immediate sense, if you just imagine standing on a tightrope, of how the emotional punch of imagery can kick in. Um, or you don't need to imagine it. If you see it, you can also get that incredible sense of something. Um, so, viewing images or perceiving images in one mind's eye have a profound effect on our physiology and our emotions and, and our work. Um, but there's something else to this that I think is really interesting, and you can say I went a bit overboard now googling pictures of people doing type whipping. But um, I'm not really sure. I think that there's no such one thing as mental imagery. It's just a just one way we have to start opening up a much broader conversation so there's all sorts of gaps to cross um, <clears throat> and one's between the science and the practice of how it's useful but one of my take home messages from yesterday is perhaps it's not the presence or the absence or being one end of the cliff or the other or on the tightrope that's interesting it's to perhaps being aware of what we do and of our process. And I think Ed talked yesterday about process and asking people to introspect. Most of the time we don't do that. We just sort of, we are. Um, and that's really interesting. But there's no good or bad to any signs of these cliffs. It's just a curiosity about where they lead us. Um, and this reminded me quite early in my particular work. The reason I got into imagery was actually um, I was really, really interested in perception. Um, and I got really, really interested in haptic perception, which is kind of how we touch and explore the world through um, our, our touch senses. Um, 
and that's really interesting. And then I worked um, with people who were uh, congenitally blind or had acquired blindness for quite some time. And anyway, one thing and another. I ended up working in New York and was very fortunate to work on the first ever touch tour at the Met of working with people who had never seen on touching objects um, and being able to bring to mind what that was like or to have an experience of, for example, we worked on the Egyptian collection at Sphinx. And that was really important because people weren't allowed to touch objects. So it's kind of deliciously satisfying just because I don't think museums should be things that you can only <laughs> not touch objects in. You should be able to. If they've survived for 2,000 years, they're quite happy to touch a piece of granite. But that's a whole other thing. But the point is, people even... Um, I suppose very naively as a young scientist, I hadn't imagined that how rich the imagery could be with someone who had never seen, and that it goes into other modalities, haptic space and so on and so forth. And this opened up a whole just curiosity about how we use imagery, the assumptions we make about it, and perhaps some of the most helpful things we could do is to talk and ask people more about it. Um, uh, but there's no right or wrong, and there's no th such thing as a lot of imagery or a little of imagery being a good thing, and I feel very clear about that. It's really what you want to experience and how that might be and what happens. So that was my journey into um, asking about imagery in a whole variety of contexts, um, both from an, uh, a number of years working with people who identify as blind and then later in my clinical work. And I would use imagery quite a lot. I'm, I had talked about people who like music on, people who like silence. I'm somebody who has to work in incredible silence, otherwise it's a, bit, it's a little bit too much. So if I want to calm down or I think about something nice, I would think about the tiny, tiny cabin with no electricity that we go to. I'm half Swedish. This is what Scandinavians do. Uh, we go out somewhere where there's no electricity and, and calm down every weekend, so I think about going there my, and it brings me down and that's, that's very useful and, and that's one way of using an ability to, Im to image and we talked quite a bit yesterday about perhaps one might deploy imagery in different contexts um, in different ways um, and this is a picture of Joel's brain um, just showing there's not an eye there where the visual cortex is <laughs> even Joel doesn't have one there, it's hard to believe isn't it? Um, um, but I guess coming back to a theme from yesterday, when we talk about imagery, any modality for me is what's interesting in imagery, not just visual imagery. Um, and the University of Plymouth, John Andre, Jackie Andrade and John May have worked actually on a multisensory imagery questionnaire, which is very good. I think it came out about two years ago in that regard. And we've got the debate that Adams referred to on one hand of people saying, really since the inception. Isn't it incredible to think that psychology only arose like in the late eight, you know, 1800s? But anyway, at the beginning of um, the field, talking about people who varied in their imagery ability, um, and people just noticing, for example, these are the writings of somebody who was the first to translate the Pali language in India, uh, who writes a lot about um, psychology and Buddhism and, and the intertwined interplay between perception and internal and external world. So there's been a long, long discussion. And one of the really interesting papers in this so-called debate showed that um, people who believed more in imagery were higher imagery scorers and people who didn't really think it existed were lower imagery scorers. So that just shows you, as psychologists, we think we're objective, but scientists are very influenced by their own experience. And so the debate continues. Um, and this is a uh, debate. And then the paper that I had the, the pleasure of working on with Joel and colleagues, um, really trying to um, wrap some of these threads of arguments over, over the years together and, 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 and try and think, well, it does exist, and some people more than others, and, and ha what's the evidence for that? So I think this is a really nice summary if you want to read something science in the area. And I guess what my group's work has been very interested in, in saying, well, if we can finally agree it exists and doesn't exist and so on and so forth, what does it actually do? What can we use it for? Um, and emotion is the piece that I'm going to focus on now. Um, and the headline or the, the, um, the conclusion after about a decade of work um, was that if broadly 
we can we conceive of when we're conscious of thinking we can think in words or images but when we think in the form of images they have puck they sort of pack more powerful emotional punch um, and I'll, I'll give you an sort of example of 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 the sorts of experiments that we would do because our method unlike if I'm working as an artist, what I would do if I'm working as a psychologist would be to, to have a debate or have a hypothesis. So we might brainstorm as a team and say, what's the hypothesis? What's the, the, the question we want to address here? And then we use laboratory methods. So we try and standardise procedures and give the same stimuli to everybody. We randomise people to groups and we, we test out if, if we can falsify the hypothesis, and that's that's the sort of backbone of experimental psychology. Oh, and I should say, to do this, our group's called um, EMEN, which is, a, I don't know if anyone's ever read any books by Astrid Lindgren, like Pippi Longstocking, it's one of my favourite characters, banned in America at one point, can't believe it. But, um, uh, but EMEN is even naughtier than Pippi, he's brilliant. But um, he's, a, he's a little boy, but he's got a lot of energy but it also happens to stand for Emotional Mental Imagery Lab, so there we are. Um, and Astrid Lingerand lives around the corner, lived around the corner from where I live, so there we are. That's the link. But, but what I really should say is that science is an incredibly multi-team effort. So what, what you're lucky enough to do as a scientist is to have people who work on PhDs and postdocs who come through in their journey through science, through your lab, and here are some of the people who've all have that sort of experience. We sit around, we have intense debates in our lab groups. Does imagery have a more powerful impact on emotion than words, or does it not? Uh, does it impact our behaviour? We have intense debates on a weekly basis, and then someone might find something that they find particularly interesting and shape experiments that then go forward in a line of thought to test those ideas out. Um, and here's some of the people that I've been very fortunate enough to work with over the, over the years, and you'll see some of their names come up Again, and these are particularly people who've all had an imagery interest, and they're from an extraordinary range of backgrounds, from um, psychiatrists in Hong Kong to colleagues in Sweden, colleagues in Oxford and Cambridge, but lo all different sorts of backgrounds and all very curious about mental imagery. So here's one of the debates. Okay, we can think in words, we can think in images. Um, do images have a more powerful impact on our emotion? And in all science, the hardest thing is coming up with a question. Um, how we test it, um, I don't know if anyone recognises these adverts from a, a bank a while ago, I won't advertise the bank, but anyway, so the idea is that you can emotionalise picture stimuli very easy by a, label, by a label, which means that we can control, we can get people to see the same pictures with different labels and make them either positive or negative, even though the picture itself is not particularly here or there. Um, and that's nice if we're designing an experiment, because we can then say we'll take negative picture word combinations and positive picture word combinations, and what we'll ask people to do, and this is a study just taking people from the general population, so all variations of imagery ability, but we'll try and encourage some of them to use Im mental imagery more, and some of them to use mental imagery less. And we'll do that by providing a simple instruction. So if you're assigned to the verbal instruction group, you're asked, please make a sentence to combine the next picture and word. Could someone do that? Just make a sentence about that picture and word. I see a view of the cliff. Thank you. Or you could say, um, could you imagine the combination of the picture of word? And somebody who uses imagery might report that they see themselves seeing the view of the cliff. Um, we can also take them in a more emotionally... Um, um, sorry, that's the, the same stimuli. Or we could use verbal instructions, use a sentence to combine the next picture of word with something that makes it a little bit more emotionally laden. And they might say, ooh, I see someone putting out a type. Uh, I, sorry, I might, sorry, I'm in the verbal condition. The verbal condition might say, um, uh, a, a tightrope is put between the cliffs. Or you could ask somebody to imagine the combination of the next picture of word. So to, to push more into using imagery for exactly the same stimulus. So what we're doing in experimental psychology is trying to keep the stimulus very similar, but the way you engage with that stimulus very simply different just by pushing around the way that people are asked to be thinking. And the question is, if you ask people to engage in their imagery, as in the imagery condition, or you ask people to engage more in their verbal thoughts, what happens to their emotions? 
And in the graph I'm about to show you, what we've got on the y-axis is a measure of anxiety. So the higher the bar is up, or the, the higher the, uh, the, uh, the bar, the more emotion, as it were, someone's feeling in an anxious direction, or the lower, the more they're feeling positive. And what we can see is that in the black bars, we get those people given the imagery instruction. So for exactly the same stimulus, if we're just asked to imagine more, you end up, after seeing many of these examples, having a higher negative emotion for negative combinations and a more positive emotion for positive combinations compared to thinking about things in the forms of words where people's mood is more stable. Does that make sense? And that, I think, echoes very nicely to... If we wind on some years, um, Joel presented some data yesterday, sorry, on Friday, working with people. Um, you had a, a group of people with Amphantasia and then a group of people who without. And you showed in your work, on this initial work, very similar results in as much as that um, when asked to when, uh, imagine stimuli, there's a stronger emotional reaction in people um, without um, amphantasia than those with. So it's a different way of designing a study, but gets to a very similar uh, conclusion that imagery, to some extent, um, has an e a propensity to bring emotion along with it. Yeah? And I'm not saying that's good or bad. In fact, my argument's going to be it may be both, but we'll explore that during the rest of the talk. Mm. But this was the first study that, in the literature that, that um, did that. Um, and after a series of studies, we began to forward the conclusion that imagining events can be more emotionally powerful than thinking about them verbally. And the reasons are exactly the reasons that we've talked about, perhaps that imagery is very similar to perception. Joel's talked about this. Um, you've also talked about this yesterday. And I just added this slide because it's not just for visual perception, also auditory perception. And I know there's an interest in multimodal imagery. Um, but what's really interesting is that if we go back to the lab and say, right, OK, we've done 10 years looking at imagery and animation. What, we, what else are we interested in? People will say things like, well, does it push your behavior around? If things are more emotional when you imagine it, it's the same stimuli, does it also shape, does it mean that people are more likely to act differently? And this is a study run by Fritz, this is just a runner, which is just out, where he got people to think about tasks. I don't know if anyone else procrastinates here. <laughs> I, was a sub, I was a very happy pilot experiment uh, person in this one. Well, he took p things that people procrastinate with and were putting off, and we got some people... There's many, many, many different routes to solving procrastination, so this is not a cure for procrastination, because we can actually do it in lots of different ways. But one way you might simply be able to do it, or one way that's common in the clinical literature, is to tell people to schedule in activities and then do them. Yeah? And it's sort of partially effective. Better for some people than others. But what we found out, for those that were able to imagine, if you ask them simply to imagine and simulate those steps um, in more detail, so doing exactly the same things of putting them in their diaries and you know, coming up with reasons for and against, you should eat five vegetables a day, whatever it might be. It wasn't actually five vegetables a day. This is things more like going to the gym. Um, <laughs> I only did this experiment for a week. Um, uh, those assigned to exactly the same information, but those encouraged, just as we did in the emotion experiment, to think more about these steps and simulating them in an imagery form, went on to complete, to be more motivated and complete them more than those who did not. Now, that's very interesting, <coughs> in as much as we might think about imagery amplifying our emotion and our motivation, but it doesn't say it's the only way to amplify motivation, quite the reverse. And what I would take back to the lab and well, another discussion would be, well, internal imagery is just one way to do that. And equally, an other way to do that is also external imagery, as in drawing. So the experiment that hasn't been done, and there's, oh, there's so many experiments that haven't been done, but a really intriguing experiment that could be done would be to, sit, to repeat this experiment using externalised imagery rather than internalised imagery, which links a little bit to the talk we had yesterday about Pixar. So to draw one's imagery out in front of one is, is just as an effective task as doing it internally. Uh, for some people, and it's all about trying to match the most useful strategy to one's own process. Um, so I think it's really interesting. Um, um, so, what we do in the laboratory is we try and look at things under standardised conditions, and if we run a series of experiments, it permits us to suggest uh, conclusions, for example, that imagery can have a much more powerful impact on emotion and our behaviour 
Um, and we've heard a lot from your brilliant talk yesterday as well about um, imagery and its way of shaping perception, att attention, etc. Um, so, very curious about this phenomena. Um, I'm really curious about this as well. If it's psychology is a young science, but if it's the case that it's a fairly um, common experience, why is there so little research on it? It's kind of interesting. Or how is it we can go about our entire lives and never have asked ourselves whether we do or don't have it? I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. But it's something that I work a lot when I train clinicians. Um, and in the various ways in which we work, part of our life is in the laboratory, testing out questions, either in behavioral studies or fMRI scanners or whatever it might be. But part of my life is also around trying to bring ideas from science into clinical practice. So I would train people who were, for example, <laughs> clinical psychologists or psychiatrists. And when I work with training people, I mean, of course, you've got the contentious debate. It's unbelievable how, just as you noticed, Adam, how little we talk about imagery, which is why this conference is so incredibly important. Um, and it's important to put on the map. And when we talk about, um, it's not only that we, in I suppose I want to go one step further. It's not only that not having it or having it hasn't been talked about or perhaps in the way that it might have been. But for me, when I have patients with particular issues which are exemplified by a problem with too much mental imagery of an emotional kind, um, somebody might have had that symptom for many years or decades without ever having talked to another human about it. Um, and that's very interesting. So we sort of lack a language which puts <coughs> patients and clinicians in a room together um, in a way that they feel comfortable to talk about it. So what we do in our clinical training is always start with a bit of work. Um, and there's always some clinicians who don't have imagery where we get clinicians uh, to measure how much imagery they tend to engage in themselves. Some people have a lot, some people have very little. And think about, well, what are you bringing when you meet another human and you're talking with them to the table? Because that will affect the conversation that happens in the clinical room. And then for people who are high images, they unfortunately assume that if they can see something, then everyone else will just tell them about their imagery. And that's actually very rarely the case, and particularly not the case in mental health. So why would patients who might have been suffering from, for example, I work a lot with trauma, so post-traumatic flashbacks, not tell somebody about what's in their mind's eye? Um, and we try and take clinicians who perhaps haven't had that experience and get them to think about why they need to think about the range of mental life experiences um, and why it's so easy not to talk about it. And part of it is as simple as mental imagery is not exactly something that we talk about on the back of a cereal packet. It's not something that we, we talk about in schools. It's not a term unless you've studied psychology <laughs> or read an article that we use. So what is it? Try and demystify it. We're very clear that it's, some, some is visual, but most much is multimodal. We also make it very clear that in any dialogue, um, unless one talks openly about things, you get a sort of stuck into a don't ask, don't tell situation. And this is very particular to mental health. This is not a general thing about mental imagery, but people can have an, um, worries that if they tell us about, for example, memories that trouble them that they may be overly interpreted as a sign that they're really going mad, which is of course nonsense, but people have all sorts of um, preconceptions from society and stigma in films and so on, so on and so forth. And for people whose imagery is so vivid and real, they very, very much worry about telling clinicians, which makes it then ha 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 because they think it will become true. So you've got this whole spectrum going on. And the first thing that we argue is that a clinician needs to work out where they are how they speak about it, and then we can work about it. And as far as I know, I think we're probably one of the only uh, trainers that we know of who work in this way. Um, but I think it's really interesting and speaks to, uh, well, actually, that's really funny, isn't it? It speaks to the notion of speaking to, about imagery. But um, I hope that would be interesting. So, so simply coming away with the permission to talk about it and a sort of way of doing that, I think it's very uncomplicated and practical. Uh, and it makes our jobs as clinicians much easier.
Um, and it's about teamwork. Every conversation is about teamwork and understanding what's, uh, how you speak to somebody else. So anyway, 20 years of work later, um, we've spent a lot of time trying to bring mental imagery into the mental health domain arena. Um, and I emphasise, it's not because I think it's meant the, a consequence of mental imagery is either problems or benefits for mental health, it's just that it's not really talked about. So people talk a lot about what are you thinking, uh, but not what are you imagining. Um, and because I've been doing all my work with people who were blind, when I arrived in clinical training, I just naively started asking, on what do you imagine? Then all of these things came out, which are really, really interesting. Um, well, I don't think my lecturer was very happy at the time. Um, and, but it actually worked out really interest, in a really interesting way. And we began over a series of years documenting different sorts of imagery in different conditions. Um, and I thought I'd share a few examples of that to try and make it more concrete. Um, because one of the things that, if we fractionate imagery into, there's loads and loads of different types of mental imagery. But one quality of it, <coughs> presumably because it's so like perception, although not identical, is that um, if somebody is prone to imagery and they had a car crash with a, a green car, then that green chair could cause that image to pop to mind against that person's will. So it becomes an intrusive image. And we know that from literature. I mean, Marcel Proust wrote about this very vividly when he ate his madeleines and then his whole childhood, well, not all of it, bits of his childhood started coming back. So that's just something that heads do. Reminders of pictures in our minds will bring back pictures in our minds. So they are called intrusive. And in clinical psychology terms, an intrusive image is one that you do not want to have. Yeah? So, so that contrast, you can have intrusive images of nice things. So at this time of year coming to England, Wordsworth wrote, you know, we all had to learn that in primary school, presumably. <laughs> Poems, I don't even really like the poem, but anyway, you get stuck with a daffodil for the rest of your life, yeah? So you, he writes about these things flashing upon that inward eye. So something that's very vivid that people, uh, that he saw once, and then he uses this and it boosts his mood, it's positive. Now, the problem in the world that I work in is that if an intrusive image can be triggered by reminders in the environment and the content in that image isn't of nice content like daffodils, if you like daffodils, but it's of something difficult, then it can cause what we would call clinically significant distress. So it could be of a car crash, for example. So the particular piece that we specialised in is intrusive, i.e. unwanted imagery of uh, maladaptive and difficult content. So we've worked for many years in um, the area of trauma. So this is when an event happens um, where someone's life is at risk. It could be a car crash, but it could equally be a war or another uh, difficult situation. Um, but it's also incredibly common. So uh, people who have a traumatic childbirth, that's a childbirth where, where the mother or the child is at risk, have very high risk of developing post-traumatic stress disorder or these images that intrude when they don't want them to. Um, and people who've had pain experiences may have um, sensory images of pain that come back. Um, and people who are very low in mood may, this is a painting from 1936 called Despair, and this is imagery showing that imagery can not only go back to a past event that happened, but can also time travel forward to a future event. Now, in mental health, when that's unwanted and emotional, um, that can be very unhelpful, as you can see in this painting, um, because it's, it ends up with somebody simulating how they may harm themselves, and therefore um, one would be working hard to try and um, manage the impact of such imagery. And similarly, just because imagery has um, an emotional content, it doesn't always mean that negative is bad and positive is good. So in our work with people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, they may spend a lot of time also mentally trying travelling, but flashing forwards to something they wish to acquire. And I can never remember what this type of car is, but... It's an expensive car. So it could be an unrealistic goal for a particular individual, which then might get them in trouble. Um, so 
what we've done there is review the notion that um, mental imagery per se is neither a good or a bad thing, but when we look at the domain of intrusive mental imagery, per definition, that imagery is unwanted and associated with distress. And it, perhaps it's not so surprising if we looked at those experiments that we reviewed at the beginning showing that having an image can lead to a much more powerful emotional reaction. So seeing that car or seeing that cliff in your mind's eye is going to have a much stronger impact on both your emotion and your behaviour than just thinking about it. So these two phenomena tie together, and I think these in a clinical situation make us realise why this kind of imagery can it be extremely difficult for people um, and a job to work in therapy with would be to and science is to how one might work to reduce the impact um, and dysfunction of intrusive unwanted imagery um, so I was going to give you a couple of examples of the sorts of things that we would do um, Again, with the caveat that a lot of this interplay between science and clinical application is really still in its infancy. So we're talking about the last 20 years. And I'm going to talk about two examples. And the first one is like perhaps what you might imagine therapy to be. So it's like it really is like with a therapist and two people sitting in a room talking to each other. Um, and then the second example is going to kind of go full circle back to the science that I talked about in the beginning, look nothing like therapy. Um, but bear with me. So, um, I was very lucky when I, I talked to you about the time in New York and working at the Met on touch tours for people who are blind and being really curious about people's inner imagery. Um, so when I got back to London, was doing my clinical training, got into trouble for asking everyone about what they were imagining. Said, That's not in the manual. <laughs> um, uh, I was very fortunate to meet Anne Hackman, um, who we've dedicated our book to, actually, um, who, who said, no, well, keep asking. That's really interesting. And she'd written this very first paper about how some people with very high imagery ability would see themselves in a social situation. So if I had social phobia, for example, I would see myself from your perspective, how I'd look from the outside, perhaps being very red, sweating, and I'd be good <laughs> gracious, and that would probably make me want to leave right now. Yeah? So she'd written this beautiful piece on this, and that gave Anne and I a way of talking together and being curious about mental imagery and writing the first ever book on how one might want to discuss and use imagery in cognitive therapy. And when I talk about cognitive therapy, what I mean is um, it's, a, it's a form of cognitive behaviour therapy, but it happens to be a therapy with what's so-called an, uh, an evidence base in terms of national, in the UK, National Health Service guidelines. So the sort of therapy that's been tried and tested in a research context to, to work for given disorders. But even if it works, the, most, the biggest thing about, or one of the problems that we have today is that it, on average, only works for about 50% of people. So what we spent time doing is saying, well, if you're only looking at people's verbal thoughts, and many people also have image-based <laughs> recognitions, then we need to think about those two and include that into the discussion in therapy. Um, and that's a, a book which is a little bit about the science, but most about the practice of asking about and using imagery techniques. But the moment you write a book, you spend 10 years writing the next one, um, on the side of doing the lab experiments, of course. And so the book that's just coming out next month, and I'm really sorry, I wanted to bring an example here, but I will talk to you about the, the content, is saying, trying to make that much more accessible, because... Um, as we just talked about a little while ago, many clinicians don't use imagery themselves. Um, and therefore, what we realized was that um, we needed to find a way of working together in teams um, where people would bring different strengths to the table. So someone who is a high imager working with someone who is maybe a low imager, um, but making our, our techniques as simple and accessible as possible to facilitate communication. Um, and so this book's tried to do this uh, in, a fair, in an extremely transparent way. Um, and we happen to be working with people 
uh, with a so-called diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, and the reason for that is that if you look at the evidence base for bipolar disorder, um, we have very little innova innovation in techniques since the 1950s, and that's something I feel very strongly about. Um, it's a very, very neglected group, um, and very little talking methods for this group. Um, um, whereas we realised in our laboratory work and then our clinical studies that, that people with bipolar disorder were, could be very good at imagery, have very vivid and compelling imagery, and if we just but anybody who has a lot of vivid and rich imagery, uh, if you believe my experiments that I showed you at the beginning, and you're thinking in imagery more, it just means that your day is becoming slightly more emotionally amplified in small events all the time. So our hypothesis was that imagery was simply m acting as a mood amplifier. Does that make sense? And therefore, it's not a whole, a, a one simple thing to do uh, all of us react if we're having imagery in this mood amplification way. But if it's also pushing our behaviour for this particular, for people who are high images, learning to manage our imagery with quite interesting set of techniques. And, and we, I've talked to you about the large lab group and everyone throwing in ideas and then fighting about them and then coming back to them and then agreeing on them and testing them out. We basically came up with, after about 10 years, four very simple techniques. Well, actually one's complicated, but three are simple. Of, of working with when you have an intrusive unwanted image, what do you do with it? If your life is being pushed around by amplification imagery, how do you learn to navigate within that? Um, and I won't go into detail, but the, um, the four techniques are around learning that one's inner world isn't actually real, uh, learning actually a little bit like a film how to rescript the outcome um, if one's good at imagery how to compete with imagery that's just being too much, and how to come back to positive imagery. Um, and the overall aim in this kind of work um, is to try and get mood instability to, from going, rather than being amplified all the time, into a more stable pattern. So you can see here again how the, the wish is to try and do something simple in the face of complexity. What's the smallest thing that we could do to have impact? Um, in the fewest number of sessions to help modulate a particular process. Um, and that's described here. So, so that's the sort of more, tr that's the side that works more in traditional face to face therapy. For the very last part of my talk before we wrap out, what I want to do, well, actually, there's two last parts, but the last bit, I know, but um, last parts plural, um, is just tr if we look back at these techniques, um, the third one sounds a bit odd, imagery competing tasks. And um, one of the things we do in my lab is play a, uh, a regularly a kind of break, break the rules game. Like we have so many assumptions about what we think therapy should look like or what might be helpful. And I, it's just a historical accident that you put two people in the room and talk. I mean, that's lovely. But, but what if we could just really go down, for example, the imagery vein and think, what could we do that was helpful? So um, I'm going to try and just give you a taste of why some computer gaming at some point may be useful. Um, and if we go back to the unwanted imagery that I talked about, so many, many, most of us will have an, an experience of a, an event, which is a, a life threat event at some point during our lives, unfortunately, a car crash, for example. Um, but these imageries are very, if you have an image that's intrusive, they tend to be very vivid and very colorful and moving. Um, and occur again and again. They can occur for decades um, in some people. So despite the fact we know that, for say the women with traumatic childbirth, about a third of people will develop such imagery, we have no preventative interventions to stop women developing such imagery, despite we know the event occurs. And that would not be allowed in physical medicine. If your child was bit by a dog, you'd get a rabies vaccine. Whereas in psychology, we know full well that people have a particularly stressful event, and yet we have no treatments at all that are evidence-based out there. I think that's just kind of incredible. Like For the historians, that's going to be incredible. Um, but I think it's not completely 
unfamiliar with the remit that because we speak so little about our inner worlds and the things that are causing trouble, that these images can rumble and persist and people won't say or, that they're there until too late. So we undered, wondered, and this is, uh, we didn't like wonder once, this is a lot of intense discussion debate for a long time. Could we dampen down, could we do something like really early on to stop these images becoming a problem for people? Um, and of course, there's never going to be enough therapists and counsellors, however much people like to throw, fly people in after a crisis. So what could we do? And why on earth did we come up with playing Tetris? It's on every phone. What else do you have to do when you play Tetris? Stare at the screen. Stare at the screen, exactly, not in your head. So you're staring out at the screen, not in your head. Great. And when you stare at the screen, what do you do? Make water of things. Yeah. So you're moving the shapes and you're focusing on colour. So it's like kind of very much about colour, shape and movement, yeah? <laughs> Outwards. And do you know what? Our brains, as wonderful as they are, can only do one thing at once. Yeah? So I can talk to you on the phone, well, most of our brains anyway. I'm sure we always have an exception. But I can talk to you on the phone and doodle, because that's verbal and writing, no problem. But I can't doodle and uh, do something that's very, very image-based at the same time. You, we have limited capacity. So the idea was, when a memory was very hot, and this is a whole science that I won't go into, it's called the science of memory consolidation. When, um, when a memory is being formed and laid down, could we do something really simple that took the very intense, vivid colour part just out of that memory slightly through playing, in this case, Tetris. It doesn't have to be Tetris. It could actually be lots of different things. It just happens to be the one that was very freely available. Um, and we've done it with very boring lab tasks as well. And, oh, look, it's Joel's brain again. <laughs> so it can be for resources that that memory needs to be stored in memory and become intrusive. We are not wiping out the memory at all. And I should put that up right from the beginning. So we've shown in a whole series of other experiments that we still retain knowledge for the event happening and what happened. All we're doing is taking the hyper-vivid, colourful thing that's making it flash back to mind when you don't want to have it away. Yeah? So I'll show you what the data looks like. So this is, I've kind of talked through the rationale. Um, a little bit. And yes, it does sound completely crazy, but that's what happens if you work with a lot of very talented young scientists from different disciplines. Um, and I really enjoy it. So um, first of all, we have to set up, uh, this is anything but Pixar. We set up horrible films in our labs. Uh, they're actually quite they're this kind of thing. So films that will then haunt you once you've seen them, because that's like a lab study way of studying intrusive memories. Um, uh, and then we can test after someone's seen this film whether an instruction process inclu including this visual spatial task very soon after viewing the film will lead to people in the real world when they monitor them in a diary having fewer intrusive memories if they get our seemingly off the wall computer game treatment compared to if they get a controlled placebo treatment. Does that make sense? So um, here we'd allocate somebody to seeing a horrible film, uh, either a, a visual treatment, a no task treatment, or a very verbal, like a British pub quiz computer game. And we don't think the pub quiz, that's words, not images. So that's not going to help. Yeah? And that's exactly what our data starts to show. So I've got the control condition here. We've got the number of intrusive images of trauma in an experiment on the y-axis. So this is, we've got less compared to the control condition in our visual computer game, but not for the verbal computer game. Now. Um, so this led us to ask the question, could we really develop a, a kind of vaccine after something really horrible had happened? It's a metaphor. It doesn't really mean a vaccine. We're not injecting mm -hmm. people. We're just saying, could we help prevent these intrusive memories coming to mind? And these are just proof of concept studies. So we tend to do about 10 years of studies in the laboratory, really gritting out <coughs> the different parameters. And then we moved, uh, and the papers published last year, into the real world. And this is a study where Lali and I were embedded in the accident and emergency department of a hospital. And we would meet people within six hours of having a very severe motor vehicle accident. And we took a protocol that was very similar to our lab protocol, where we thought back to it, we taught how to use mental rotation, and then did the task. And what we're going to be looking at is, again, on our y-axis, how many 
intrusive memories did they have of their work traffic accident compared to a group who got another task? It was a more written verbal task. Um, and what we see in the study was we were really pleased. We got really similar findings, actually slightly better than in the lab. So this is people in the placebo condition, and this is people in the playing Tetris condition. And those people in the week after they were discharged from the hospital had about a, a third of the number of intrusive memories of their trauma. And what you can see is that a lot of people won't develop intrusive memories, but what we're doing is knocking out those people who are very vulnerable to intrusive memories. And those, those aren't occurring. Does that make sense? And then if it should work for road traffic accidents, as you know, um, one of the things I'm interested in is, for example, traumatic childbirth. So mothers who often don't talk about their experience, a third of these mothers will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And we do adapt the procedure, this photograph is with permission, so that mothers could do the intervention in the wake-up room from after emergency caesarean section. Um, it doesn't require talking to another human, it doesn't require having to get really distressed, but it gives them something to do very early on. And what we see is a very similar pattern results. So in that first week, this is a control condition. Those with the Tetris intervention get a lot fewer intrusive images to the traumatic childbirth. Um, and um, we've just started working, and, and I, our studies take a really, really long time. So this is working with people with older memories who are impatient, actually with colleagues in Germany, working with people very, very, um, uh, to adapt the procedure, and it's very, this is not an evidence-based treatment, this is science meets clinical practice and trying to think how we might be able to work with imagery that's problematic in different ways, but trying to target those memories that are intrusive with a very similar procedure, even if they're very old memories of trauma that happened a long time ago. And the results so far are looking really interesting. We're really learning from that, that we can dampen down the specific memory that's intrusive, but not the memory we don't target. I have a wider interest in this. I live in Sweden. We um, have a lot of refugees, very young ones, 50% unaccompanied by their parents at the moment, and a, a third to half with symptoms of post-traumatic stress. So we're doing a little bit of work at the moment thinking, actually, um, very humbly at this point in my career, I would say, <coughs> got to move away from talking therapies and try and think about how we could reach people in, in the way they wanted to. If I'm a young man who's escaped from somewhere, I don't particularly want to see a mental health pro professional, but I might be very happy to do something uh, on my smartphone. It's not a cure for everything, but are these kinds of innovative new ideas coming straight from the lab and from my irrepressible team of young scientists who argue with me all the time? Um, uh, will they help provide tools that we should work at scale? And so this is the really last thing. Impact, like science and clinical work need to come together. We haven't spoken about imagery for almost 100 years in sufficient detail. Conferences like this are putting it on the map. Imagery is neither good or bad. It can be extremely useful for certain puzzles. It can be extremely burdensome when you're having it when you don't want to. But there are things that we can do. And I think it's a really nice space where actually it might help us think differently about how we might want to work with, in my one area of interest, which is mental health, in the dif differently. We, there, we're not even touching mental health globally. So could we think about changing the way we think about our mental life and, and, and thinking about, even if it's low intensity tools, new ways of working with images um, for good and for bad. Um, and we've written about I won't go into this into detail, but just the how opening things up and asking questions. Um, this is the fourth plinth in London, by the way, um, um, is the way we've got to go forward because we have not seen a major advance in technique since the 1960s in either pharmacology or psychological treatments. So let's break the rules. Therapists might not need to involve therapies, therapists. Um, and we have to 
everything we can learn about imagery, about when it exists and doesn't exist, how to modulate it, when it brings joy, when it brings sadness, <clears throat> is stuff that we can learn to enrich what we're doing. Um, and it's just really interesting, which just takes me back to the beginning of the talk about little pieces of the puzzle, one experiment at a time, getting your views about what we should be researching on, what we should research on. Sometimes you don't know where it's going to go, and sometimes um, one just has an ambition about where it might go. But I think it's really, really interesting to explore, and I'm really, interest really, really happy that by talking and meeting here today, it's trying to put mental imagery and the lack of mental imagery and all the shades in between clearly on the map that we need across disciplines. So thank you very much. OK. <laughs> OK, so let's find out what you uh, made of that. I think you were quickest on the draw over there. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that you see this effect of the Tetris game uh, in the traumatic childbirth condition because um, childbirth is not very visual. As the woman, you don't see much. So how is it uh, stopping traumatic images, or is it a different kind of traumatic imagery that they're having? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. So we have a paper, if you're really interested, we have a paper that's just out on the kind of images that people experience after traumatic childbirth. Actually, about 70% is visual. They just didn't realize they were images. There's a lot of uh, bizarre rectangles. Yeah? And if you imagine you're on a hospital trolley, that's what you're seeing. So there's, there's a lot, there's much more visual imagery than you think. Um, but it is multimodal. But the way we often think about imagery is that you can tackle... So Tetris is kind of interesting, despite it being like the most old-fashioned computer game in the world, because it's, it's visual and it's spatial and it's adaptive. So I think it's, it's competing with image and space. So a lot of other imagery is spatial. And um, what we... Uh, so I think it's doing more than we, we... It's not just the visual component. But what I think we don't have, and what I would love students to work on is olfactory images and because we have nothing for that yet and that's quite common. Okay, it's a great question. Yeah. Chuck further down the same line. <coughs> I just want to go back to the experiment at the beginning about the typo and the yeah. distinction between the, the verbal and the images and um, as someone with no image sense I can still feel really anxious yeah. about the typo in a way that is not verbal or image. Yeah. And so yeah. the closest way I can think of describing that is like uh, proprioception, like a sense yeah. of your body position. So I wonder if proprioception, is that included under the sort of umbrella of the data? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. it doesn't really seem like... Well, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the word image, so, it's body, so you can recreate bodily feelings and sensation. But, but I guess one of the really interesting things would be, so in, that, in those experiments that in psychology what we would call, um, they're just shifting someone's tendency in one way or another, like how much they're deploying that and it's part of their process. So it's not saying that someone's only doing this way of working or only doing that way of working. And I guess when one has proprioceptive imagery as well, would you think that, um, the, the interesting thing is if you came into a part in one of the studies, would you find the ones where you're giving the imagery, so focus on your proprioception, would you get a, a more powerful emotional response to the ones where we said, and focus more in this verbal, concrete way? And my hypothesis would be that that one would, would might, a, may create more of the anxiety that you described. Yeah, yeah. the verbal would be a distraction from the sort of underlying proprioceptive sensitivity. It might be, yeah. Or, it would, or just not, like, or not take you down that path. So not necessarily that you have to push it away, it's just that we, we do, when we deploy processes, we're, we're, we're using them at different times. We're just not often aware of how we're doing that. So some of these instructions and you're scaffolded in the experiment to keep to task, help okay. you do that. Thank you. So let's, let's move on to a new topic. Let's try something over here. What have we got? Thank you. Um, not everyone who experiences intrusive images is going to develop a mental health problem. And so you have to look at, I guess, uh, some of the predispositions, such as genetic predispositions to um, developing mental health problems. So is there 
conversation going on between the people who are doing your research and then the people who are studying some of the genetic bases for mental yeah. disorders? There's a, there's a long conversation. So my interests are, are, are pretty broad in mental health, actually. So I'm very, really interestingly, genetics take us some of the way, but a very, but it's been extremely hard to find any kind of genetic marker of a disorder like PTSD. I don't think it's going to ever just be in the genes. Something like a stress reaction is to do with what's happened to you and your memories. So there's one paper last year trying to find a marker, but I don't. To, but I think what, you, what it goes down to is a more fundamental question of should we be looking at prevention for people at risk or p universal prevention? If your child was bitten by a dog, you wouldn't sit there saying, sh you know, not everyone's going to get rabies, should we or should we not vaccinate? So I guess you have all of this debate going on in the prevention field. Should we try universal approaches or targeted approaches? There are pros and cons. But one way to really think about impact is that we have so few predictors of who's going to get PTSD, despite knowing up to 20% of severe car crash accidents, a fifth, a third of women after traumatic childbirth, 50% of people who are raped, 50% of people who are tortured. So we're talking about quite high numbers. So in that case, I think one could argue both ways. If we've got limited resources, sure, just target those at risk. But given the fact we don't know, maybe we should be thinking about very powerful interventions that we could disseminate so people have that information. Um, we haven't solved that puzzle, but I guess that's something that comes up in our lab all the time. We'd love to know who's at risk, we just don't. So what can we do that's simpler? Okay, uh, let's see. So keep your hand up if your question takes us in a very different direction to what we've had so far. That's just encouraged even more hands to go up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there's so many more people you're going to disappoint than make happy, let's come all the way down Thank to you. here. Um, I work as a psychotherapist and counsellor and use a lot of imagery and I am totally aphantasic with no other sense. And when I first heard about imagery, I thought, I don't believe it can work for me because of it. Yeah. But then I decided, mm. if I focus on something with a, a thought very deeply, like the take the simplest thing, relaxation, and then breathe it down through my body and imagine, I don't see it, all thought, my cells are taking in this wonderful scene that I'm not seeing. I believe that works for me now. Now, is it my belief system that's creating the imagery working when there's just thought? Or is there something about, you know, that actually I... The imagery is working because my body feels a lot more relaxed when I just think and just think it going through my body. And is something happening? That's my question. Can I ask, as I said, aphantasics, is it possible if we believe it and use it, it will work for us? I guess, I mean, the, what you're doing is opening up a really interesting conversation. And I guess what I've learned from Adam is that there are different degrees of, it's not necessarily aphantasic black white, there are different degrees. And I guess we're trying to be aware of our process or what we can evolve. So I'm very, very optimistic. I talked about when I started my career working with people who are blind. And people say, oh, no, they won't have imagery. It's complete nonsense. It's very good imagery. If you're blind, you want to be able to navigate extremely well because you can't and remember how to get from here to the shop. So actually, you've got to create imagery, but it's spatial and in a different way. So, so perhaps the question is becoming, in a guided imagery script, how can we open it and test it in a way that it's best suited for that individual who wishes to use it um, and keep exploring? But absolutely, the dialogue should not be to rule things out, but to keep exploring just as you've done. So at the risk of trivialising things, what I want us to try and do now is a sort of quickfire version of this, where we ask fairly short questions oh. and fairly short answers so that okay. we can try and cover as many of the things together as, as possible in these last few moments. You at the back, sir. Um, it's just a quick one. Do aphantasics suffer from post-traumatic stress a lot less? Because I would never have flashbacks as you did. So, <laughs> I think it's a good question, one Adam and I have discussed briefly. I don't, I don't think it's going to be that simple, partly because you could still, at the moment, you could have, if you've got any ability to represent the world, you could do, that could be relived again. And so it depends on how the extent of that. And clearly, um, post-traumatic stress in its entirety can take a, a variety of forms, but specifically a propensity to individual in visual images, if you don't have visual images, that part one might not have. 
Okay, thank you. So but this I think will have it's to something we should look at. Yes. Quick, quick fire, remember? Oh, well, no, I, I'm not very good at that as an academic. Okay, so one last question. Uh, you at the front, sir. Uh, okay, do you want to talk? In, in mental imagery disrupting tasks, you're talking basically about visual things. But, for example, would it help to um, play music or do something else which is not visual in nature, but nevertheless could somehow disrupt the imagery? Um, you should come and do an experiment. Um, but um, usually, we, I guess we would hypothesize that the modality might match if you had an auditory image, a musical toss. But absolutely, we, this is, we are at the infancy. So there are so many studies exactly like that that we need to be testing. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Thank you for Emily again. And, uh...